Rogue Wave, Part 2. In the blackness, water continued to lap at Scoot's chin. She had settled against what had been the deck of the galley alcove and her body in an upright position on debris. Everything's not tied down or in a locker was now between the overhead ribs. Wooden hatch covers from the bilks were floating in the water and the naked bills were exposed just aft of her body and now above it was the small diesel engine as well as the batteries under the water were cans of oil one of them leaking battery acid might leak too few sailors could imagine the nightmare that existed inside the sea dog scoot's pretty face was splashed with engine oil. Over the next five or six minutes, Sally dove repeatedly, using his feet as a fulcrum and using all his strength that he had in his arms, legs, and back in an effort to open the doors. The pressure of the water defeated him. Then he thought about trying to pry the doors open with the wooden handle of the scub, scrub brush. Too late for that, he immediately discovered. It had drifted away along with Scoot's nylon jacket, her canvas boat shoes, and anything that could float. Finally, he climbed on top of the keel, catching his breath, resting a moment, trying desperately to think of a way to enter the hall. Boats of the Baba class built for deep water sailing, quite capable of reaching Honolulu and beyond, were almost sea tight unless the sailor made a mistake or unless the sea became angry. The side ports were supposed to be dogged securely in open ocean. Aside from the cabin door, there was no entry into the cabin without tools. He couldn't very well claw a hole through the inch of tough fiberglass. He thought about the hatch on the foreduck, but it could only be opened from inside the cabin. Then there was the skylight on the top of the 17-foot 17-foot 17 17 cabin used for ventilation as well as sun source. The butterfly window hinge uh, in the middle could be opened only from inside. Even with scuba gear, he couldn't open the skylight unless he had tools. He fought back tears of frustration. There was no way to reach Scoot, and he knew what would happen down there. The water would slowly and inevitably rise until the air pocket was only six inches, or her head would be trapped between the surface of the water and the dirty bile. The water would torture her. Then it would drown, drown her. Seawater has no heart, no brain. The sea dog would then drop to the ocean floor, thousands of feet down, entombing her forever. Maybe the best hope for poor Scoot was that she was already dead, but he had to determine whether she was still alive. He began pounding on the hall with the bottom of his fist, waiting for return knock. At the same time, he shouted her name over and over, nothing but silence from inside there. He wished he hung on to the silly scrub brush, the wooden handle would make more noise than his flesh of his fist. Almost half an hour passed, and he finally broke down and sobbed. His right fist was bloody from the constant pounding. Why hadn't he gone below to make the stupid sandwiches? Scoot would have been at the wheel, and when the wave grasped the sea dog, his younger sister, would, all, with all her life to live, would be alive now. They'd had a good brother-sister relationship, he teased her a lot about being pint-sized, 
and she teased back, holding her nose when he brought one girl or another home for display. She'd always been spunky. He'd taken her sailing locally in the channel, but she wanted an offshore cruise for her 14th birthday. Now she'd had one, unfortunately. Their father had nicknamed her Scoot because as a baby, she'd crawled so fast. It was still a fitting name for her as a teenager. With a wiry body, she was fast in tennis and swimming and already the school's champion in the 100-yard dash. His eyes closed, teeth clenched, and he kept pounding away with his bloody fist. Finally, he went back into the ocean to try once more to open the door. He sucked air, taking a half dozen deep breaths, and then dove again, bracing his feet against the companionway frames. He felt every muscle strain, but the doors remained jammed. He was also no now aware that if they did open, more water would rush in and he might not have time to find Scoot in the blackness and pull her out, but he was willing to take that gamble. Scoot awakened as water seeped into her mouth and nose. For a moment, she could not understand where she was, how she got there, what had happened. Vaguely, she remembered the boat slanting steeply downward as if it were suddenly diving. And she remembered feeling her body going up. That's all she remembered. And all she knew at the moment was that she had a fierce headache and was in chilled water in total darkness. It took a little longer to realize she was trapped in the sea dog's cabin by the galley alcove. She began to feel around herself and touch floating things. The air was thick with the oil smell. Then she ran her hand over the nearest solid thing, a bulkhead. That's strange, she thought. Her feet were touching a pot. She lifted her right arm and felt above her, the galley range. The galley range above her, the boat was upside down. She felt for the companionway steps and found the entry doors and pushed on them. That was the way she'd come in. The doors didn't move. Sully crawled up on the wide hall again, clinging to a faint hope that a boat or ship would come would soon come by. But the sun was already in descent, and with night coming on, chance of rescue lessened with each long minute. It was maddening to have her a few feet away with and being helpless to do anything. Meanwhile, the hall swayed gently in eerily silence. Scoot said tentatively, Sully? Maybe he'd been drowned. Maybe she was alone and would die here in the foul water. She repeated his name, but much more loudly. No answer. She was coming out of shock now and fear icier than the water was replaced her confusion. To die completely alone? It went that way for a few desperate moment, moments. And then she said to herself, Scoot, you gotta get out of here. There has to be some way to get out. Sully clung to the keel with one hand and his body float against the smooth surface of the hall. There was ample room on either side of the keel for the dead rise and the upward slope of the hall. The sea dog had a beam of 10 feet, unless a wind and wave came up. He was safe enough in his wet perch. Scoot again wondered if her brother had survived and if he was still around, the boat or on it. With her right foot, she began to probe around the space beneath her. The pot was drifting away, but her toes felt what seemed to be flatware. That made sense. The drawers with knives and forks and spoons had popped out, spilling its contents. She took a deep breath and ducked under to pick out a knife. Coming up, she held the knife blade, reached skyward with the handle. 
eyes closed, brain mushy, exhausted, Skelly heard a faint tap and raised up on his elbows to make sure he wasn't dreaming. No, there was a tapping from below. He crawled back towards what he thought was the source area, the galley area. He put her an ear to the hall. She was tapping. He pounded the fiberglass yelling, Scoot, Scoot, Scoot. Scoot heard the pounding and called out, Sally, I'm here, I'm here. Her voice seemed to thunder in the air pocket. Skelly yelled, can you hear me? Scoot could only hear the pounding. Help me out of here. Ear still to the hall. Skelly shouted again, Scoot, can you hear me? No answer. He pounded again and repeated, Scoot, can you hear me? No answer. The hall was too thick and the slope of the sea, the moan of the afternoon breeze didn't help. Though she couldn't hear his voice, the mere fact that he was up there told her she'd escape. Sally had gotten her out of jams before. There was no one on earth that she'd rather have as a rescue man than her older brother. She absolutely knew she'd survive. Though it might be fruitless, Sally yelled down to the galley of alcove. Listen to me, Scoot. You have to get out by yourself. I can't help you. I can't break in. Listen to me. I know you're in water and the best way out is through the skylight. You've got to dive down and open it. You're small enough to go through it. She could go through either section of the butterfly window. Tap twice if you heard me. She did not respond. And he repeated what he just said word for word. No response. No taps from below. Scoot couldn't understand why he didn't just swim down and open the doors to the cabin, releasing her. That's all he needed to do. And she'd be free. Sally looked up at the sky. Please, God, help me. Help us. It was almost unbearable to know that she was alive and he was unable to do anything for her. Then he made the decision to keep repeating. Listen to me, Scoot. You, you'll have to get out by yourself. I can't break in. Listen to me. The best way out is through the skylight. You've got to dive down and open it. You're small enough to go through it. 